morning. Uh, this is Dr. S.P. Harsa, Faculty of Mechanical and Engineering Department, IIT Roorkee. Uh, I'm going to present today the basic course of engineering science that is the strength of material in which the first lecture is the introductory lecture in which uh, I'm going to present the key features of the strength of material like uh, what are the forces, what kind of forces are being applied in the solid mechanics uh, like uh, if uh, there is a pulling kind of thing is there or the compression is there or or if there is no uniaxial, biaxial forces are there, then how these forces are being set up within the solid bodies and due to these forces, what are the internal resistances are there in the solid object through which there are, you see, you know, like uh, the stresses are there, the strains are there, the deformations are there. So all these issues I'm going to present here in this first lecture. This course is basically developed under the national program on technological enhanced learning. So <clears throat> as you see, you know, like the this course is comes under the engineering sciences because in that there are lots of applications are there in that. So we can uh, you know like uh, usually subdivide these engineering sciences into the various category and the first category is the solid mechanics in which there are solid objects which are interacting to each other. So we need to analyze those solid objects using the mechanics concept. So in that there are you see you know like the two main branches one is the statics in which uh, the static forces are being set up in the solid bodies and the forces are there due to interaction. So and the other uh, branch of the solid mechanics is the dynamics in which the dynamic forces are there in which the forces are being you know like the time varying component. So when the object is in the moving part we know that the dynamic forces are there and they are dominating in those conditions. So uh, the solid mechanics basically dealing with the solid uh, objects which are interacting. Then the second uh, uh, sub, uh, the division is there under the engineering science part is the fluid mechanics. In fluid mechanics basically we are you know like dealing with that how the fluids are interacting to each other and what are the molecules in this fluid mechanics they are interacting. That's what you see there are various forces which are you know like uh, uh, co uh, uh, we, we can say that cohesion forces are there or the combined forces are there due to which the Flu fluids are being confined to you know like in the main object and that's what you see you know like uh, here there are various categories in uh, the fluid mechanics also like uh, if the fluid is uh, very tiny or the thin is there then we can say that you know uh, the laminar flow is going on when it's, there is no uh, dynamics is there in which uh, the fluid particles or uh, on the second category we can say there is a turbulence is there in which there are hectic uh, uh, motion is there or we can say uh, truly nonlinear dynamic motions of there of the fluid particles. So and then there is an uh, you know, like the interaction or the we can say there is a intermediate portion is there in between those uh, laminar as well as the uh, turbulence part. So these two you know like uh, the uh, subdivisions of the engineering science is basically dealing with the different domain. Uh, one is the solid as well uh, another one is the fluid and the third one which is the heat transfer. So heat transfer can take place into you know like either in the solid as well as in the fluid. So that's why you see you know like uh, we are categorizing this heat transfer into three main categories. One is you know like uh, the main mode is there that is the conduction mode which is a highly molecular phenomena like if you see you know like if we have the different temperatures all, ac uh, all across the solid then there is a heat transfer right from one end to another end through conduction. So this is a purely molecular phenomena. Second we have the convection which is uh, different than the first one because in that there is a uh, interaction between the solid as well as the fluid and the convection is takes place. And the third is there is the radiation which is you know like the microscopic phenomena is there in which the radiations are there and which is emitting from an object. And there are you see you know like the Stephens laws are there to analyze those things. And then the final which is an important division of an engineering science that is the properties of material in which you see you know, like uh, we are generally categorizing the materials into various uh, you know like uh, uh, the categories but broadly speaking then there are two main categories under this that is the ductile material as well as that is the uh, brittle material. In the ductile material again there is you know like the ductility is the property. So in that we are assuming that if a material is ductile that it is pretty easy to extend or it is pretty easy to uh, just pull those material. But if we have a brittle material then it does not have that kind of property. So what we are doing in that we are it is because you know like the brittle materials are good in the compressive stress the compressed strength. So they are good you know like the harder material. So based on what properties are there we are always applying you know like the material towards the application. 
So this, uh, you know, like uh, if you are dealing with the individual subdivision of these engineering sciences, then we'll find that it is not, you know, like we cannot fully analyze all the structure using the sing, uh, individual, you know, like concept of these mechanics, either the solid mechanics, fluid mechanics, or the heat transfer in which the uh, this uh, temperature phenomena are there, or the properties of material in which you see there are various properties like uh, the stiffness is there, like the damping is there, like uh, hardness is there, toughness is there, the impact is there. So these are the properties, you know, like. Uh, which always gives you a, a basic information that which material is applicable to what kind of application. Although you see there are you know close link in between them in terms of the physical principles and th that's why you see we are using these basics of these are we can say these are the four basic pillars of the engineering sciences and you see if we want to make any kind of building we need to know that what these interactions are there in between these four uh, properties or we can say subdivisions of the engineering sciences. So that's why we are saying that you know like uh, we need to you know like put the basic link based on what the physical principles are there involved and that is the nature is nature is always saying that you see you need to maintain that what the physical you know like setup is there in between these objects. And then you see we can go for the variety of the methods of the analysis which are employed you know, like uh, for all these things and that is the, you see the basic study of the engineering sciences. But here you see you know like as far as this course is concerned our main focus is on solid mechanics that actually how these you know like uh, the solid objects are being you know like set up and how these forces are being well set up within those objects. Then if we are going towards the introduction as I told you that is, as far the subject is concerned. The solid mechanics is as a subject may be defined as a branch of the applied mechanics because again you see you know like what we are doing here applied mechanics and the applied mechanics we can go for solid as well as the fluid mechanics but here it is a basic branch of the applied mechanics solid mechanics in which we are dealing with the behavior of solid uh, bodies as I told you earlier subjected to variety of loads like you see if uh, there is a pulling then we can say the technically we can say it is a tensile pulling or the tensile load is there if there is a compression then we can say the compressive loading is there but these two loads you see you know like comes under the main category known as the uniaxial loading because of you see if the load application is there always you see you know like uh, load can be defined by you know like the variety of the things like you see if you are saying that it is a force then force is nothing but the mass into acceleration but the key feature in the force is what is the point of application. If the point of application is same like if, we am, if I am pulling from both the side this force is known as the load that is the tensile loading that means the pulling is there. If the in uniaxial even loading if I am saying that this is the compression which is also you know like uh, acting on the same axis we can say it is a compressive kind of loading. So uh, these two either the tensile as well as the compressive com comes under the uniaxial loading but if it is a biaxial loading means you see you know like on the plane like this x and y on a plane if the load is there then we cannot say it is a uniaxial loading. So loading can be of uniaxial as I discussed it can be of uh, biaxial or triaxial but we need to know that actually if these loadings or the forces are being there they have to be you know like satisfy the static as well as the dynamic conditions of the object then only we can say that the object is under equilibrium position. So there are as I told you the variety of you know very various types of loadings are there like you see you know like uh, so if it is a uniaxial then tensile as well as the compressive loading is there if it is a biaxial then it is shear loading is there if object is stationary or if object is moving then we can say it is a kind of torsional loading is there like the soft is moving and you know like on both the side if the uh, forces are there the reacting or couples are there or the forces are there you see we can say this kind of the torsional loading is there. This is usually subdivided into the further two stream which is the basic thing you see uh, first is the mechanics of the rigid bodies or we can say it is a simple mechanics in which the statics and the dynamics is there and second is the mechanics of deformable bodies. That means you see you know like uh, one side we are saying that this is the rigid body in which there is a minimum chance of the deformation. They, since the object uh, solid objects are there they are interacting but they are so rigid that there is no deformation occurs and if there is no deformation then there is no excitation is there. But if on the other side if you are saying that the deformable objects are there like you see you know like most of the objects they are deformable based on what the stiffness is there within this object this is a unique property of the deformation then you see we need to know that actually how much deformation is there it is a temporary deformation or the permanent deformation. So all this kind of analysis which is being studied under the mechanics of the deformable body. So first if we see that under the introduction of this uh, mechanics of uh, deformable solids 
which is also a part of or we can say the category of the applied mechanics is known by several names like strength of materials, mechanics of materials, okay. And in that you see you know like again we are dealing with actually if there is a deformable body then whether it is a uh, temporary deformation then you see you know like uh, under the temporary deformation there is uh, there are there are variety of the laws are there like uh, there are and this uh, modulus of Young's elasticity is there where the force is you know like uh, proportional to the deformation or there are other uh, modulus of uh, elasticities are there. So, we are dealing with many of the things and many of the limits like yield limit is there, proportional limit is there under the deformable bodies. But if it is a permanent deformation then there is a kind of cracks are there or the spells are there on the object then we need to know that actually how much the stress or the force concentrations are there within those permanent deformation. So, this this is a different branch of the applied mechanics in which we are dealing with the deformable part and that is why you see you know like in all those uh, strength of material or the mechanics of material we are basically dealing with the stress strain and the deformation ok. But if we are dealing with the other part that is the mechanics of the rigid bodies which is primarily concerned with the statics and the dynamic behavior, static and the dynamic behavior, behavior under external forces of the engineering components and system which are treated as the infinitely strong and undeformable that that is what you see you know like uh, if you are saying that the stiffness is too hard means it body is so stiff that even if we apply the load it cannot be deformable then it is pretty hard to analyze because you see the forces are there they are interacting we can you see you know like set up those forces but uh, we cannot analyze using the stress strain or the deformation concept. So, this is a different part of the applied mechanics ok. And then you see primarily we are we deal here with the forces motion associated with the particles as well as the rigid bodies in which there is a stress strain as well as the deformation occurs. So, here you see as I told you that mechanics of solid it is a branch in which there is a kind of deformable uh, bodies are there. So, mechanics of deformable solid is more concerned with the internal forces and associated changes in the geometry of the components involved because of the interaction of these objects ok. So, here you see of, of particular importance as you know like we are discussing with the geometry changes because if there is an uh, uh, impact is there always we will find that uh, there is a kind of noise why these noises are there because of the deformation. So, how these deformations are being set up whether these deformations are permanent or temporary this kind of analysis which we are going to deal in this kind of subject of a particular importance which we need to give on the properties of material what are the properties which we are using either the ductile as well as the uh, brittle material the strength of which will always determine always gives you the information whether the component will fail by breaking in the service means how long it can bear those forces or we can say whether these forces what are the forces which are applying to those things whether it can sustain those forces or not or up to what that is what you see all those designs basically you know like use this kind of basic information and the stiffness uh, this is a basic property as I told you for the deformable pro uh, object uh, stiffness of which will determine whether the amount of deformable they will suffer whatever you see the uh, deformation uh, object is there whether it is acceptable or not acceptable. So, in that if uh, you see therefore, the subject of mechanics of material or the strength of material is basically central to the whole activity of the engineering design because in the engineering design basically whatever the drawing is supplied to us we need to know that you see whether those objects or the dimensions are sustainable to the load application or not and that is what you see in that we in engineering design we always apply that what the material properties are there or what kind of load loads are being applied or whether you see this material can absorb those kind of energies or the impacts or the load or it can be safely operated or not. So, this kind of you see you know like the interaction of the informations we are always using for the mechanics of material uh, uh, and uh, for the basic of the engineering design. Usually the objective uh, you know like objectives in the analysis of any kind of analysis the dynamic as well as the static analysis will be determination of the stresses ok the internal resistances like strains that how you see deformations are there and the deflection produced by these loads. So, these are three key terms in the mechanics of solid which we need to see that what kind of stresses are being set up within the object, what strains are there and how deflections are being taken place by these load application and in that that is what you see you know like the theoretical as well as the experimental analysis is always gives you 
you know like the key information whether whatever the analysis which you have done is real to the nature or which is applicable to the real nature or not and that's what you see you know like we are doing both kind of analysis here and now you see as you know like the stress is the key feature as I told you that we need to now defi uh, define that what do you mean by the stress. Let us introduce the concept of stress as we know that the main problem of engineering mechanics of material is the investigation of the internal resistance of body because you see you know like if we apply the load always body will react by the third law of the new, uh, uh, this uh, Newton that the reaction you know like uh, action reaction is there. So, as you apply any kind of load whether it is a uniaxial, biaxial or triaxial loads always a kind of resistance will take place. So, whether you see you know like this kind of resistances can be well set up within the object or not. So, as we can say that the internal resistance of body or we can say the nature of forces which are being set up within the body which can balance or not. If it cannot balance then body will break. But if it can balance whatever the applied forces are there and internal forces if they can well set up within those objects due to the external application we can say that the body is well established under the application of load because load is always you see as I told you that force can be you know like defined by two ways one by magnitude that is mass into acceleration that is nothing but the load and by the point of application how these forces are acting on an object and accordingly the resistance forces are coming and we are saying that the intensity of the internal resistance is the stress ok. Uh, the internal resistance is per unit area that is the intensity and the external applied load as I told you forces are always termed as the loads. Now, you see this external applied forces which are the key generation of the you know like uh, these stresses can be due to many of the reasons like first the basic reason is due to service conditions means you see you know like the objects are uh, under the cyclic loading or the tensile loading or any like you see you know like uh, as uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are going towards any of the machine if you are analyzing we will find that the bearings are there, the gears are there, the shafts are there, they are always under the different kinds of loads and accordingly we are considering if we want to design the bearing, if we want to design the shaft, if we want to design the gears or if we want to design any of the static part of the machine we are always you know like uh, clearly observe that how these forces are being set up or due to the environment in which the component works whether you see it is on the normal temperature condition or severe temperature conditions and because of these things you see the thermal expansion are there or we can say later on that it is a thermal stresses are there or you see through I know like other another reasons for the applied forces are through the contact with other members and that is why you see the contact mechanics are there and we are you know like here concerning about that how deformations are being taken place due to this interaction. And then you see due to the fluid pressure that you see if rho z h if you are saying that rho is the density z is the uh, you know like the gravitational acceleration and height up to how much you know like height these fluid pressures are being exerting on an object on you know like uh, and in that even even the g is there that is the gravitational acceleration or the inertia forces due to inertia forces also you see there is one of the basic reason that the stresses are you know inducing in an object. So, now you see you know like if you come to that main point that these internal forces give rise to a concept of the stress therefore, we can say that you know like the stress is nothing but the internal forces or the internal uh, intensity of the forces like internal force per unit area and if you see this figure. In this figure as uh, we have used uh, the rectangular bar in which there is a axial pulling and since it is a uniaxial pulling so we, we can see that this is the P. Uh, P or F this is the tensile force which is the extension is there and if you want if you want to analyze those things first we need to see that whether this object is under the stable condition or not. If it is under stable condition that means whatever these forces the axial pullings are there they are well set up within those object that means you see whatever the internal uh, these resistances are there within this uh, internal, the in internal resistances are there within this object they are well set up. And uh, these uh, these internal resistances are basically due to this external uh, this excitation force that is P or F, uh, which is there in terms of the Newton. And always uh, we are concerning about these forces uh, uh, because of uh, where the point of application of these forces are, and that's why we are saying that these are the tensile pulling. Like here, you see we, from both end, this is the tensile pulling. So if you want to analyze those things, first we need to uh, make the cross section, and that's why you see you know like in this the, uh, this diagram we have shown here that there are two main 
parts and on both of the side, both of the end sides here, the P uh, external excitation force is there and due to this uh, externally applied load, we have seen that uh, if we cut those things at both ends uh, through this uh, axis line, these internal, uh, internal resistances are there. So, the each portion of these rectangular bar either on the left or right side is in equilibrium under the action of these applied load, the tensile load I should say and the internal forces are always acting at the x action just opposite to the applied load and that is why you see we can say that this is and the well established or equilibrium reason. And if you are talking about the analysis of the stress or strain within those things, we can say that the stress is defined by the force intensity or the internal resistance forces per unit area and hence we use the symbol sigma just to represent the stress that is P by A where A is the cross sectional area here which is the rectangular area is there because the rectangular bar which we have used in the previous case. So, here if we are using an assumption that the total force or the total load carried out by uh, carried by these rectangular bar is uniformly distributed all across the area because if the load is non-uniform then definitely you see you know like uh, the deformation or whatever the internal resistances are uh, non-uniform and then we cannot say we cannot say that this object is in equilibrium position but the stress distribution which we can say that you see you know like if uh, the area is different at different reasons the stress distribution is obviously the different maybe for uh, from uniform or maybe local reasons of high stress reasons are there known as the stress concentration. So, if uh, there is any abrupt changes there in an object we can say that the stress concentration is more and we need to design carefully for those kind of reasons. So, if you are talking about you know like uh, the normal stress then there is no problem because this is uniformly distributed because of the uniform force distribution in an object. If the force carried out by a component is not uniformly distributed as I discussed during like the stress concentration over the cross sectional area, we must consider the small segment or small area delta A which carries a small load delta P or we can say of the total load P and that is why you can define the a small segment of the deformation uh, for that you see the small you know like the uh, this stress is there that is del F by del A or we can say at a particular stress generally you know like uh, it holds true only when a point or we can say you know like uh, for a small reason or we can say the infinite uh, decimal reason the uh, sigma is nothing but the limit of uh, delta A tends to 0 del F by del A. So, generally what we are doing here because if we found that there is abrupt changes are there within the object uh, or we can say object is not uniformly rectangular or any shape defined shape. What we are doing here we are simply categorizing this object into various categories and then uh, we sum up those things because you see we define the stresses for a small small segment as, as we have seen in this you see del F by del A. So, you know like we can uh, again sum up those things by summing up of this limit of delta A 1, delta A 2 and delta I 3 so on and then accordingly we can get the total stress out of the whole object. Now, you see if you are going for the unit of the stress because stress is nothing but the intensity of the internal resistances, the basic units in the uh, SI uh, system is Newton per meter square or we can say the Pascal. Pascal is renowned scientist, scientist uh, which uh, gave the concept of the pressure and pressure was also you see the force point area. So, it is it has the same meaning you know like uh, it is the internal uh, resistances or we can say internal resistance of the force or we can say it is the internal intensity of the forces that is why we can define those things by Newton per meter square or the Pascal or if you go for higher uh, side of these things then it is a kilopascal that is uh, 1000 Pascal or giga Pascal that is 100,000. Uh, mega Pascal that is 100,000 Pascal or Giga Pascal that is a 10 to the power 9 Pascal or sometimes uh, it is pretty common to use the Newton per millimeter square that is also you know equals to Mega Pascal. So, while uh, you know like this is a pretty common uh, this uh, unit is there in India or in particular I should say the Asia or European countries but uh, US you see in United States of America they are using this pound uh, per square inch that is PSI that is the FPS unit ok. And now you see you know like uh, the this was the basic concept of the stresses. Now, if you are talking about the types of stresses this is there are two basic types of stresses one is the normal stress and one is the shear stress. Normal stress means uh, as I told you when the uniaxial loading is there because of the uniaxial loading whatever the internal uh, resistances are there 
uh, per unit uh, area that is always comes out from the normal stress component and that is why you see we are categorizing normal stress component by either pulling or the compression because they are with the uniaxial part and second uh, the basic stress is the shear stress if they are not the uniaxial if they have some sort of eccentricity or these stresses are there for a plane where x and y planes are there means here or here you see you know like uh, these stresses are being coming through the forces we are always saying that it's a shear stress so normal stress is a axial stress shear stress is a plane stress other stresses are the derived stresses from these two like you see you know like if you are talking about the normal stress then as i told you there are two components of that by pulling the tensile stresses are there by compression the compressive stresses are there shear stresses also has uh, uh, two components like one is if it is a stationary object uh, and you see the twisting is there then the shear stresses are there because it is along the plane or if you see we have the torsional stresses means if the object is moving we have the torsional stresses another combination of these stresses are we have the bending stresses we have and due to you see whenever, whenever the object is there in the bending stresses we have both kind of things are there the tensile as well as the compression because both stresses are coming simultaneously at different points of the bending then we have you know like the another that is the thermal stresses thermal stresses are always coming which is not the part of that but it is always coming due to the temperature variation and it is being set up you know like uh, just to make the uh, component equilibrium under the different uh, uh, this uh, temperature environment so these are you know like the derived stresses i should say and uh, some of the basic stresses are there like the normal as well as the shear stresses just like as, as i told you the torsional stresses which is uh, encountered in the twisting of a shaft which is also a basic form of the shear stresses so now come to the main part that uh, you know like uh, that how these stresses are there and how we can define those things so first the basic stress is the normal stress we have defined the stress as force per unit area that is the internal intensity of the resistances if the stresses are normal to the area concerned like you see here if we see this uh, this is sigma 1 and si uh, this is sigma 1 towards this area and this is sigma 1 towards the, that area so if the stress is acting uh, normal to the area concerned so this is my effective area and the stress is acting towards the normal to that that means this is there you see if a stress is acting and this is my plane you see or this is my the area of concern i should say this is the normal stress okay and the normal stress is always defined by a greek letter sigma as i told you so always we need to see that what is the point of application of the force or the stress internal uh, stress is there uh, internal uh, intensity of the resistance is there if it is normal then we can say or if it is perpendicular to the area concerned we can say this is the normal stress okay so this is also as i told you you know like known as the uniaxial state of stress because they are acting at the uniaxial because of the stress acts only in one direction either the tensile or the compression however a uh, state you know like uh, whatever you see this kind of state which is rarely exist in these objects so what we are doing here we are always going for the biaxial or the triaxial state of stress to define all those stress which are being set up within the component okay so uh, <clears throat> instead of stresses where either two mutual perpendicular stresses are there in the biaxial or th three mutual perpendicular normal stresses are being set up in the objects so we can define by this figure like this is the above figure the, this figure is the biaxial state of stress in which two component uh, two forms of the stresses are there in the x axis you see this uh, normal stress is there it is always lying along this line and in the y axis also this is always along this line the uh, this normal stress component is there so sigma 1 and sigma 2 are the biaxial state uh, the biaxial state of stresses are there the two forms are there and the uh, second one is the triaxial state of stress which is you see you know like the sigma 1 sigma 2 or sigma 3 is there so if you are considering all three you know axis sigma 1 or this uh, sigma 2 or sigma 3 all these uh, stresses are being well set up in uh, this object and we can analyze accordingly so either uniaxial biaxial or triaxial this is always you see you know if you want to define the real state of stress always we need to go that which will give you the real true value of the stresses within those objects now you see come to the normal stress component in the normal stress components it can be either as i told you pulling or it can be compression so if it is a pulling like you see in this figure the 
if this is a rectangular bar and if it is pulling from both the ends and since you see you know like this is you know like the normal stress component is there uniaxial part is there so if it is pulling we can say that the tensile stresses are being set up within this object that means you see you know like uh, if it is pulling the internal resistances are so set up that if they will resist this kind of pulling so that's why we can say that whatever the stresses are being induced in this object due to the application of this force tensile force these uh, stresses are known as the tensile stresses and simultaneously we can say that if the compression is there this is also you see the uniaxial uh, the state of stress is there so if you are saying that actually these uh, forces are being well set up within those things uh, we can say this is uh, the internal resistances are so you know like opposite to this kind of compression and they will always act towards the opposite to these uh, action of these forces we can say these are the compressive stresses in these two you know like uh, the forms of the normal stresses like the tensile stress and the compressive stress uh, as we have discussed that these stresses are the normal parallel to these planes so, so now our effective uh, plane of the or we can say this uh, the matter of concern is this plane where these forces or the stresses are just perpendicular or the normal to stress these things so always uh, we need to be very careful that while we while we, while we are you know like observing or anal analyze those uh, analyzing those forces we need to be very careful that how these uh, applications are there like how where they are applying whether these uh, uh, here this one or towards that direction or what is our um, you know like the plane of concern so as either in the tensile or in the compressive always we need to be careful that actually what is the plane of action is there or what is the matter of the area of the concern is so you know like these two are the basic forms of the normal stresses but if we derive those things then again we will find that uh, one of the uh, the derived stress is there that is known as the bearing stress bearing stress is nothing you see you know like when one object when two composite parties that means two different objects are pressing against each other it refer to I mean, a bearing stresses like you see the uh, two surfaces are mating to each other and there is a well set up you know like the forces are there in between uh, the portion of uh, these two objects so they are in fact you know like we can say these are the compressive stresses but if we see the plane of area then we will find that this is you see you know like in this figure uh, this is the plane of area or the matter of concern is there where the stresses are just normal you see that uh, these are the compressive forces which are acting so if you take the object or the soil any of you see this is the basic uh, phenomena is there in the uh, this uh, soil mechanics so always what we are doing here this object is always trying to press within this soil and these uh, bearing stresses are well set up within this contact region so this is our contact region okay and these forces are there from the normal stresses so that's why we can say the bearing stresses are nothing but one of the form of the uh, this uh, normal stress is there and since it is the compression is there so we can say that the compressive stresses are there so if we want to analyze this kind of object always we need to be careful that actually how these forces are being set up and how these stresses are distributing amongst these uh, this contact area so that's what you see you know like uh, if any eccentricity is there or any irregularity is there in this object then we need to see that actually how these stress concentrations are being taken place at different different parts and how these internal resistances are there within this either object or the soil because this is the contact region of the soil and here you see these being stresses are forming uh, all, all around this uh, object okay so this is uh, one form of the bearing stresses and this is the derived stresses of the uh, compressed stresses one form and then you see the another part uh, so one part was there the normal stress component and the second part is there that is the normal uh, the shear stress so let us consider now a situation where the cross sectional area of a block uh, of, uh, of a particular block uh, of material is subject to a distribution of forces which are parallel now you see this is not normal whatever the force is which is not normal to the uh, this area concerned now if they are parallel means you see this is object and the forces are applied parallelly to, to the uh, this area of concern then you see you know like then this is we cannot say the normal stress component is there then we can say that uh, these kind of you know like the forces which are parallel to the normal axis always gives you a different kind of uh, resistances or the area of concern and whatever the internal resistances are coming due to these parallel forces are always different than the perpendicular forces and such forces are always associated with the shearing of the material because they are not uniaxial they are at the different axis due to the eccentricity and since you see they are running parallelly 
to the object that means you see these forces are different at different layers of an object so always you see we need to be careful that actually how these you know like the forces are being set up and that's why we are saying that always it creates a shearing to these different different layers at uh, uh, of this particular object so uh, these forces are associated with the shearing of material and all, uh, and are always referred to the shear forces. So, shear forces you see you know like always creates uh, some sort of shearing to the different layers of an object and the resulting force intensity that means the re resulting shear force per unit effective area is known as the shear stress. So, you see this is the another form of the shear stress which in which the forces are parallel so here we can see this we have this object okay since you see this uh, uh, the here the forces are not coming perpendicular they are just parallel to these surfaces so if we have this effective surface here and these forces are acted parallelly towards that and now this is our area of concern these forces are going so always within this object we have the shear stresses which are being set up within this object and that's why you see here we are saying that uh, these shear stresses are always a uh, plane stresses because they are always towards this a uh, particular you know like uh, those uh, planes means here you see you know like we need to concern this particular plane because they are all along this one okay so that's why you see you know like uh, we need to analyze those things that actually how these shear stresses are being set up in these things uh, whether this is a uniform structure then the shear stresses are all along uniform along this these uh, this particular plane this and this or if any eccentricity or if any you see non uh, irregularity is there in the shape or the geometry of the object then we have to be uh, very careful because these are the weakest area of uh, you know like uh, the object and we need to be very careful and that's why you see accordingly we are taking the fact of safety for and this kind of uh, stresses so shear stresses are uh, more i should say you know like the dangerous because you see they are running parallel to the layers of an object then you see you know like uh, if we define the shear stresses then the you know like as i told you the resulting uh, force uh, the shear force intensity which is known as the shear stress is the mean shear stress and which is equal to this p by a p is the uh, internal you know like the uh, force resistance this resistance uh, force is uh, divided by the effective area and it is always denoted by tau so p is the total force as i told you the shear force i should say and area is the effective area under which these forces are being acting so as we know that the particular stress generally holds a good you know like uh, uh, part only at a point therefore we can say you know like the shear stress at a particular point is uh, limit you know the tau which is uh, limit uh, del a tends to 0 del f by del a so this is you see you know like uh, the small segment of force divided by the small area so the, generally you see this uh, this uh, the, this equation is valid where you see you know like uh, if we found that irregularities are more and we are you know like uh, segregating or we are separ separating those individual components because you see if the strong reason is there weakest reason is there so what we are doing here we know that the forces are you know whatever the forces dist uh, force distribution is there within this object is different then we, we have to be very careful that actually in the strong reason how much force distribution is there for the weakest reason how much you know like force distribution is there and what is the area uh, this uh, matter of area concerned so accordingly what we are doing here if you are saying that if we have an object which has uh, you know like if you are categorizing an object in six different uh, you know like the steps then what we are doing here we are always calculating tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 tau 4 tau 5 tau 6 and in all these taus always we are assuming that whatever the area of concern is there they are always to that particular effective area so that's what you see this uh, approach is known as the infinitesimal uh, part because you see in any of the you know like engineering sciences we are doing like you see in thermodynamics basically whatever uh, those uh, you know like the processes are there like uh, uh, this isotropic process isobaric process isentropic process all these processes are you know like uh, if we are going realistic then we cannot approach really because the real nature is always uh, against those things they are not you know like the reversible phenomena if if it is a real, uh, real process but always we assume that these uh, processes are really occur in the nature and they are reversible so what we are doing here we are always taking the small small segment and within this small segment we assume that that these processes are correctly applied whatever you see so similar concept we are apply here that 
whatever the small reason is there within this small reason we assume that whatever the force application is there and divided by whatever this uh, you know like uh, this effective area is there if we sum up those things by integrating all those you know like uh, the small small segment we assume that this stress distribution is uniform and because of this stress whatever either is irrespective whether it's a normal stress or it's a shear stress we assume that this stress is well set up if you sum up those things it will give you the average normal as well as the average shear stress component and that's why you see you know like we are always applying that if it is a delta f by delta a for a small segment it always limit a tends to delta a tends to zero and this will give you a small shear stress component for a segment and if you sum up those things then you will get the full stress component so if we that's why you see you know like uh, as we discussed that actually this uh, uh, shear stress is always denoted by a greek symbol tau just like you see in the normal stress component it is always either is respective of the uh, this uh, uh, the tensile stress or the compressed stress which is always being denoted by the sigma part so it is used to denote the shear stress however it must be borne in mind that the stress the resulting stress of this thing any point in a body is basically resolved into two components you know like because you know like as i as we discussed that there are two main components are there of the stress normal as well as the shear so sigma as well as tau so how these you know like the stress components are being acted separately as well as the combinedly how the interaction is there of these you see the normal as well as the uh, this uh, parallel stresses i should say parallel because of you know like the parallel forces are there in the shear so how you know like the the interaction is there of these forces and how the molecule molecules of the matter you know they are you know affected by the interaction of these stresses this is really a matter of uh, real you know like uh, uh, the matter of concern to analyze under the mechanics of material and that's why you see you know like uh, these two if you want to if, if you want to analyze any material then we need to resolve these two stresses one is the sigma one is the tau for normal stress as well as the shear stress one acts perpendicular the normal stress and other one is the parallel to the area of concern as it is clearly defined in the following figure so you see if you see this figure uh, in the previous you know like a figure then you will find that you see here that always uh, the normal stress as i shown you that the normal stress component this is the matter of area concern and this perpendicular is there and if this is my matter of a this area of um, this matter of area is concerned then the forces are being parallel to these things and that's why these stresses are being formed the single shear stress uh, shear stress takes place on a single plane and the shear stress is always you know like the cross sectional area of the rivet so if you are talking about any rivet joint always the rivet joint are being designed on the basis of uh, the shear stress that how shearing is taking place and wherever you see the shear stress because you see if you if you see the rivets they are always you see two two sheets are there and they are always combining two sheets so if you are pulling you see you know like and the force application is there on these two sap you know like uh, these two parts are different one is on the top of one is on the bottom plate so now the for the point of application of this force is acted at two different axes so definitely you see and if you want to combine those plates we are if we are putting the rivet then always there is a shearing area is there towards those connection points and that's why you see you know like if you want to analyze the strength of the ri uh, rivet then always we need to design based on the shear stress whereas the double shear takes place in the case of butt joint so if you are if you are having the butt joint then you see the double shearing is there that means you see the butt joints are always acted so that you see the area of the matter of area is concerned is twice than the rivets and the shear stress is twice than the cross sectional area of the rivet because you see it is applied at the two different points so if you see this figure then we can clearly you know like dif uh, differentiate those things that you see now the shear failure of the rivet so now you see here in this uh, we have this is our uh, the area of matter this this is our the plane and this area the top of that this is our area of this uh, matter of concern so here you see now these uh, if it is parallel so this is the parallel part so what we have we have the tau that is the shear stress and this is the normal which is a perpendicular part so we have the sigma so normal stress so if you want to find it out that how much what is the strength of these rivets are what we need to we need to resolve these you know the components like one is the uh, parallel one is the perpendicular so what is the resultant force is there and you see by resolving those things in the this uh, uh, the resultant force sr cos theta or sin theta we can get the effective solution that actually how much you know like uh, those uh, you know like the individual 
as well as the combined stresses are being set up or combined forces are being set up within this region. Once you know these things by resolving in x and y direction, you can get the effective solution that actually how these either the shear stress or the normal stress are effectively concerned to the design of these kind of structures. So, as we discussed in that, that shear stresses are always dominating in these kind of uh, uh, this uh, this kind of structures where the rivet as well as the butt joints are there so if we are talking about the butt joint in which you see you know like uh, you can see we have these two you know like uh, this is one plate this is another plate you see these two plates are there and in which you see you know like the force is acting so what we did here we simply combined we simply simply combined these plates by these butt joints so now if we apply this axial pulling here you know like the this is the shearing area you see where because it will just try to pull out but this will try to make the cohesion cohesiveness here so here this is the effective area where shear stresses are always dominating and you see now we are saying that this is the two butt joint the two butt joint means you see here that here we have the two different plates one is the uh, this uh, total plate which is being combined you know like by both of the butt joint these two plates you see bottom and top okay it is always confined it is always binded by uh, these butt joints but we have these you know like the separate plates so if you apply those things here this reason is the effective reason where the shear stresses are being set up okay now if you go to the another point that is you see the lap joint in lap joint it's a pretty straight and this is the perfect uh, uh, example of the shear stress because you see here the line of action if you see here this is my line of action for this force okay as i told you the force is nothing but the point of line of action so here you see this is my you know like the point where the line of action of force is here here the line of action of force is here so if i now combine those things so the nature of this force will try to tend this one towards this direction the nature of force of this p will try to tend towards this direction so we have a clockwise reason motion is there but this uh, lap joint will try to uh, you know like uh, put the resistance towards this clockwise you know like uh, the motion or i should say actually the line of action so you see here at these portion where this contact reason is there this hole this whole reason will suffer by the shear stresses so like you see here now like for the single part for either the butt joint as well as the lap joint always there is you see the stresses are there but if you go to the double shear like in the butt joint as, a, as we have seen you see you know like here these are the you know like the effective portions where the stresses are being well set up uh, the, these are the uh, shear stresses because as I told you, you know, like uh, these forces are there and because of the these forces, they are well parallel to this application. Means he, this is my effective area. You see, this is contact uh, area. These all contact areas are the effective areas and the force is also parallel to the effective area. That means you see here, only shear stresses are being acting on this parallel, uh, this parallel forces. So we can say if you want to resolve any of the forces within this butt joint, we need to be very careful that actually how these stresses are being you know like taken place in this object first and second you see which areas are the concerning areas or I should say the effective areas where the shear stresses are maximum applied. So here you see either the first uh, this, this figure or this figure we can clearly see that uh, this, these reasons either this reason or this reason or this reason or this reason all these four, four reasons where the contact points are there the mating surfaces are there these surfaces are since parallel to the applied force these are parallel to the applied force shear stresses are being well set up within these things the internal intensity you know like of these uh, shear forces are well set up so we need to be very careful that actually if they are uniform then you don't have to go for delta f by delta a straight way you see whatever the effective area is there how much force is there just you know like divide the force point area you will get the shear stresses okay but if you see if we have the combined stresses like you see if let us say if the any other application of the force is then we have to be very careful that actually how these forces are being you know like acted on these objects and then you see whether they are acting uh, whether they are acted perpendicular to the area affected area then you have to concern the normal stress if they are acted just like parallel as you see in this particular figure then you need to be very careful that actually only the shear stresses are there no need to consider the sigma value that is the normal stresses and if you see the final figure that is nothing but you see again a kind of lap joint 
in the you know like the double part then we can see here there is a straight shifting so as you apply the force there is uh, as you apply the load or the force in the previous figure you can see that there is a straight shifting of uh, these contact resistances so this is nothing but the pin is there so pin is now sheared so this one was you see earlier as i told this one was the key feature was there that actually how it can sustain or withstand the forces so you see if it cannot then you see it will go up to this feature if it can sustain then it has to be there within this reason so this will you know like define the shear loading of any feature and that's what you see this has a good application in boiler design because you see in boiler what we are doing here you know like uh, the lots of internal forces are coming because of you see the basic purpose of the boiler is just to generate the heat so as heat is generated you see high pressure we are generally categorizing in various types so if we are talking about the high pressure boilers that means you see uh, you know like uh, the highest pressure means actually more than 400 or you see you know like the mega pascal of the steam is to be generated within those things either the coal fire or whatever you see you know like uh, this uh, steam generation is there so in that you see boiler always boiler surfaces are being you know like uh, by lap joint or we can say butt joint so in these joints because of the internal forces you see always it tries to shear those uh, different mating surfaces and that's why you see you know like uh, in these things uh, if boiler failure is there means explosion is there uh, uh, it is because of the failure of these uh, one of the basic reason is because of these failure of the joints so these joints may fail and uh, you see you know like it's a clear shifting is there so in this lecture you see you know like uh, since it was a basic lecture you see you know like so we discussed that uh, what the forces are you see if we are talking about a solid uh, you know like a part then there are deformable there are rigid bodies in this deformable bodies as, as we have discussed that actually you know like how the deformation takes place what is the you know like the point of application of load is accordingly we can categorize the two basic forms of uh, the stresses like the normal stresses as well as the shear stresses how the normal stresses can be acted like what is the point of application of forces there in the normal stress even itself that whether it is you know like towards the uh, you know like uh, the pulling side or the compression side or it is a you see you know like the bearing stresses so accordingly we can categorize those things like you see we have uh, the tensile stress compressive stress or we have the bearing stress while other thing you see we have if the forces are not parallel or uh, more not perpendicular to the plane then automatically it is parallel to the concerned area then you see you know like we have to be very careful that actually since it is not uh, on the same axis it is on the plane along the plane so how they are acting whether they are just tried to tend these object to rotate those things or not because always when they are not uniaxial definitely you, they will just try to act at a different axis that means there is due to these forces there is a chance of the object will tend to move in any of the direction clockwise as well as anti clockwise so if you want to define the sign convention of these stresses always we need to see that how these in uniaxial form or biaxial or triaxial in the normal stress component or the shear stresses how they will you know like act on the object and correspondingly see you know like uh, we will define that okay now since uh, these two forms of the stresses are there one is the normal stress one is the shear stress in the normal stress there are you see you know like ten, uh, this uh, tensile compressive bearing or in the shear stress side even the shear stress torsional stress so these are the two broad categories and then you see you know like there are uh, like bending stresses are there which are nothing but the combination of the compressive as, as well as the uh, this uh, norm, uh, this, uh, this compressive as well as the tensile stresses so these are the derived stresses are there and the last one was the thermal stresses which uh, you know like uh, due to the temperature variation they are being set up so in that the it again depends on what is the thermal coefficient of the expansion it so it uh, it's a property of the material so this in this lecture we basically concern with those, those kinds of stresses so in the next lecture we will just try to analyze that if you see you know like if these two stresses are there then how how many forms of these stresses which we need to define all those forces which are being set up within the object is necessary whether these two forms are okay like you see one part is sigma one part is tau is well set up or do we need more part like you see in x direction or in y direction or in z direction in all the uh, all the directions if we have pulling uniaxial pulling or the plane forces are there like you see this parallel forces then these two uh, parts are okay or do we need more uh, forms of the stresses so like you see you know like uh, all these issues which we are going to discuss and if they are pulling then positive and direction is there or if we are you know like compressing there the negative direction are there so what is the basic direction or if it 
just be, be due to this uh, shearing part uh, if it try trying to tend in the clockwise or anti clockwise direction then what is the sign conventions are there or if we have you know like uh, the direction of the force and the area if both are acting at the same place then you see how you can define whether it's a normal stress or it's a shear stress so all the sign conventions with the subscripts are there you see we just want to define in the next chapter okay thank you